Brothers and sisters in Christ, today we hear from the epistle of St. Paul to the Ephesians, that great document of ecclesiology in the church, which lays out the spiritual foundation of how we understand what is the body of Christ, what is our role in it, and what is our relationship to God in it, through it, and to each other as well. And so in, in this reading, he begins by speaking of gifts, pointing out a quote from the Psalms. When he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Do you know which psalm this is from? This is from Psalm 68, which you may be somewhat familiar with because we sing a good chunk of it at Pascha every year because it begins with the words, let God arise and let his enemies be scattered. Let those who hate him flee from before his face. It's a hymn of victory by King David. And in it, God is extolled for rescuing those who had been held captive and setting free those who were prisoners and in the danger of death. In verse 20, we hear, for example, Our God is the God of salvation, and to God the Lord belong escapes from death. And so we hear this verse, which is verse 18, and in it, the translation given by St. Paul says, He gave gifts to men. But actually, if you look at the Greek and the Hebrew, it seems to indicate that the translation should be, and he received gifts from among men. If you look at your uh, Old Testament, that's usually the translation that you'll see. However, we should not think of this as a mistranslation, but rather as a, a very fine Pauline nuance. Because for it to say that God received gifts from among men, is to say that God gave gifts to men. Because everything we have comes from God. If you will, it's kind of like the, the father who on Christmas finds his children coming to him with all these presents that they want to give their, their dad. And of course, he, he opens them kindly and gladly knowing that uh, his wife picked them out and it was paid for with his credit card. <laughs> So God, even if God does receive gifts from them, another important point is He immediately gives it back to us for the edification of humanity, for our use. He doesn't keep it for Himself. What use does God have for anything that we could possibly give Him? He is already omnipotent and omniscient, all-knowing, all-loving. And so St. Paul says, of, of these gifts, that he gives them for what? For the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, until we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So, and actually the sentence doesn't end there. It's, a, it's one of those classic long sentences of Paul that you have to really dig into. But what's important here is, is to understand this. We receive from God these gifts, and they are given with a purpose. We are being called to fulfill that purpose, to grow in the fullness of faith, to grow in our understanding of Christ, the knowledge of the Son of God, and to see in ourselves through that process not just an intellectual awakening of knowledge, but in fact, a complete transformation of our personality, a restoration of our humanity, an integration of our mind, body, and soul, and a complete union with Jesus Christ in God. So of Christ, of whom we are growing into the likeness through these gifts, St. Paul adds further along in the epistle reading, in verse 16, which we didn't read from today, he adds, of Christ from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies according to the effective working by which every part does its share causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. Okay, did you get that? The whole body joined and knit together by what every part supplies according to what works based on what every part gives and has for its share, causes the whole body to grow and build itself for the better. 
on a plot. So this is, in fact, the image and the description of what church is supposed to be. It is a corporate body, not to use the economic sense of corporate, but in the bodily sense of corporate, a corporate body of individual members who join together and are knit together, combined together, and help each other grow together as one community, out of love. So if you are part of the church, and I hope that you all are, you are part of a living, breathing, working body. Each one of you plays an important role in the functioning and the health and well-being of that body. You each have been given gifts, special gifts, gifts which you may or may not be aware of, that you have been given to help that body grow. Just like your liver, your pancreas, your toes, your hair follicles, and every part of you, no matter how insignificant it seems, all plays a part in keeping the entire body healthy and fulfilling God's purpose. So, to this end, I wish to briefly comment on four aspects that of what we need to understand about our gifts and how we should use them. The first is leadership, because if you look at this epistle, he actually points out a number of special ministries or gifts, right? What does he have? And some he gave to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, and teachers. All five of those are basically kind of leadership positions, not necessarily. Prophets, for example, are not necessarily leaders in the traditional sense. They may be, in fact, kind of contradictions to the leadership. In fact, very often they were. The prophetic voice is often a voice which stands outside an establishment in order to provide corrective. It's a reference back and forth, the dialogue between the two. And of course, pastors and teachers are leaders, but they are also servants, which we'll talk about as well. But it's important to note that the first thing we do need to be able to recognize and to bring out of people are those gifts that they have for leadership in the church. I'm pointing this out because at St. Mary's over the last uh, several years, I've noticed that we have a certain leadership deficit in the church, and it's, it's a false deficit. It's not that we don't have good leaders in the church. We have exceptional leaders in our church. The problem is we have a lot of leaders who are not leading in the church. They're leading in their jobs, in their careers, in the service of our country, and in many other capacities and facilities. And they're doing amazing jobs at it. And I'm incredibly proud to know all of you who do that. However, I really do wish that more of you who have these gifts and talents would apply them in leadership to the church. So we have that leadership deficit. It's, it's a good problem, by the way, to have. Because you can have the opposite problem. And that's a problem where you have a lot of people who want to lead, but don't have the gifts. <laughs> and believe me, that's a, not, not a pleasant situation. <laughs> I, of course, am the chief among sinners in that regard. But if you have gifts of leadership, if you understand what leadership means, and that, you know, we're not talking about something incredibly theological. We're talking about simply knowing how to help people accomplish their vision. Knowing how to help a community, a body of people, fulfill their purpose. Knowing how to de delegate and designate and discern. These are the roles of good leaders. And these are the kinds of things that we need. At the end of the month, we'll be having our parish assembly. One of the last things we do at every parish assembly is to, not, uh, is to present... A, a slate of candidates for the service of the parish council. I encourage all of you to take a time and a turn on parish council at some point in your life. Uh, so I think of somebody at our parish council meeting uh, last week that suggested that we should we should look at the nation state of Israel, who requires every citizen to give some uh, service in their military. Maybe we should have everybody who's a parish member has to give some a year in the parish council. I don't know about that, but. I think it's not a bad idea. Because it's when you're in those positions of leadership, you find out if you have the gifts or not. Uh, you find out what it really means and what it takes and what are the issues that our church has. There's a lot of behind the scenes things that need to be 
taken care of so that you can come on a Sunday morning and enjoy a beautiful liturgy, enjoy wonderful fellowship, receive the body and blood of Christ in a consistent and, and uh, dependable manner. It doesn't happen by us. The second point I'd like to make about these gifts is the gift of discipleship. We don't always think of discipleship as a gift, but it also is a gift. Not only do we need good leaders, but we need good disciples. A disciple is a follower. A follower doesn't necessarily mean somebody who's slavishly obedient and never questions authority. In fact, I don't like those kind of disciples at all. I'm not very good at being one, that's why. I've always been in trouble. But being a disciple also means recognizing leadership in others and being willing to follow Understanding the spiritual fathership relationship that's in the church with the bishop to his priests and his communities, the pastor, the parish priest and his community to his spiritual children, and in families, the fathers and mothers to their children. Now this is an understanding, and that's where in fact you learn discipleship, is from your parents, hopefully. And parents teach your children discipleship, so that they can become good disciples. Because we also have needs of many disciples. Uh, I probably mentioned this before at some point, but and I'm sure you've all heard it in some some place. But you probably know the Pareto principle, right? Which is something to the effect that 10% of the people do 90% of the or 80% of the work, 80% of the people do 20% of the work, and 10% of the people do 0% or less. Because there's some people who just do are clogs in the machine. God bless them for our salvation. But that, those 80% of people who do 20% of the work are, are part of that body of disciples. And, and they're an important and essential part too. I don't agree with them or resent them because they're not doing 80% of the work. That's a calling and a gift that people have. And not all of us are going to give that 80% even when we gave it at one point of our life. There'll be times when we're giving a lot and other times when we have to back off and just be disciples for a while. And understanding that gift is important too. So I encourage you to think about those things and discern what is God calling you to in the church? Is he calling you to a role of discipleship right now or perhaps to rise up to a level of leadership? By the way, in our church I'm happy to say that it's not the 80-20 or 80-10-10 split. I would say it's more like 30 or 40 people a percent are doing a, a, a big chunk of the work. And you'll see this in the assembly when we publish our who's who list of people doing ministries in the church. The third point I want to make to you is qualifications. When I say, maybe you should consider these things, and maybe uh, you want to discern your role, and things like that, one of the things you might immediately be tempted to think is, yeah, but that, that's not a job that I could do, because I'm not such and such a person. I was, I was surprised to hear from somebody that they believe that at St. Mary's there is a notion, for example, that the parish council president can only be a man and can only be a cradle orthodox or somebody who's been orthodox for a really long time. I thought, wow, I didn't know that there was that perception. And I thought, well, I can understand maybe why, because that's, I guess, how it's been. But that's not at all the case. I would very much welcome any person who has the gifts of leadership regardless of their gender or ethnic background or history of conversion or whatever, to consider taking upon that role and that responsibility. Because it's not our qualifications that in the end make the big difference. It's what God's gift to us is. God gives these gifts to us, not we come up with them ourselves and we invent ourselves for them. So that's really important to realize. We have a lot of incredibly talented people and leaders who maybe don't fit all the traditional qualifications that people made up, by the way, not given by the church for leadership. So think that. If you have any doubts, ask me, and I'll tell you. And if I really don't think you're, you're the right person for a certain job, I'll let you know. I love you. But I'm not afraid to tell you a hard truth sometimes. The last thing is needs. The point of needs. St. Paul mentions these roles, pastors, evangelists, apostles, teachers, 
We certainly have those needs in the church always, and we're always looking for them. And there are a lot of other needs that the parish has, and I've mentioned a few of them in particular. Parish council leadership. We're trying to do some pretty um, demanding and exciting things, I would say, here at St. Mary's, and we'd like to keep it moving in the right direction, and that's going to take people who are willing to get involved. But we also have many needs that aren't maybe necessarily so glamorous. There's a small cadre of people here at the parish who do a very special work of love, and that is um, cleaning up the church after Sunday, or sometime during the week, cleaning up the crumbs. And by the way, if you look in your bulletin, I have a little point about crumbs that I want you to look at and carefully read. Or wiping down the icons from all the lipstick that gets put on them. Putting things back in order. So that when we come, the church is as good as we can make. And you know, they are not thanked very well, and I should thank them more often, and I do thank them today, here and now. And there's a lot of little jobs like that throughout the year. The, the, the men who volunteer to, to mow the lawn. And there's some people say, yeah, but Father, why do we have to do that? I drive a long way to church. Why do I have to do that? Why can't we hire somebody to do that? Because it's our house. And it's our Father's house, more importantly. And when we were children and our father or our mother told us that we had to do chores, we didn't say, yeah, but why don't you hire a maid? Because I don't feel like doing that. What did your dad say? <laughs> it's, a, it's a labor of love. Anything that's done in the church it's, it comes back to love. It's a labor of love. A love for God, our Father, whose house we dwell in, and it's a love for each other, for our brothers and sisters, that we share all of these joints and parts and jobs and duties of which the whole body of Christ is made. So think about these things. You were asked in the stewardship form not just to consider how you might financially support the parish, which is extremely important, but also how you might give your time and your talents. And in fact, we put that first on the list so that you think about that first and get only to the financial stuff last. I hope that you check mark those, and I hope that uh, we can call upon you for those. And if you haven't filled out your pledge form, please do so as well, so that we can know your gifts, your talents, and how you, out of love, can serve your Father who is in heaven. Brothers and sisters, Christ is among us. He is not a